All right, everyone. So we're continuing on with DSP Reacts to Down the Rabbit Hole Dark Side Phil. So far, part one was all about my history in Street Fighter. That's a separate video. You should go check that out. If you haven't yet, enjoy it. Thank you for watching. Now we're getting into the YouTube days. Let's continue. Five also had marked the year of YouTube's creation, and in 2007, just two years later, people began uploading videos of themselves playing video games while often adding their own commentary Super over Mario the RPG. gameplay, Great a game. practice borrowed from internet forums. <clears throat> they also borrowed the name, Let's Plays. Discovering this medium, Philip began posting his own videos onto YouTube by pointing a video camera at his television screen, then uploading the files onto YouTube on a channel under his typical pseudonym, Darkside Phil, in all undercase. True and false. Half true, half false. Yes, I started recording with the video camera. I pointed at the TV. It was a very, I called it a very guerrilla style of content creation because I knew it didn't look good. As you can see, I didn't even have an HD camera. So I pointed it at an HDTV and angled it to fit it all in a 4-3 shot, even though my TV was 16 by 9 aspect ratio, okay? Yes, I did upload it to Dark Side Phil. That is correct. However, his entire premise is false. He says, oh, Let's Plays were actually becoming very popular on YouTube. Phil discovered this and decided to start doing his own. That's actually completely false. At the time when I started uploading to YouTube 2008 regularly, there was nothing like this regular on YouTube that I could even find. When I was playing a certain game, I, I've, I've mentioned this over the years, I was playing a game called Lost Odyssey. It was an RPG, JRPG, very challenging one. And I was looking for insight on how to beat a certain part. All I could find was walkthrough videos with no commentary on them whatsoever. I couldn't find anyone who was playing the game and commenting on how to win. There was a certain super boss fight I wanted to win, and I couldn't figure out how to do it. And the video was showing someone do it, and it took like 45 minutes, and it wasn't the party build that I had, so I was like, I can't do it this way. And he, they weren't commentating, so there was nothing to add to it to make you understand the fight. It was very confusing, all right? At the time, I wasn't watching YouTube content at all. So on a whim one day, after having injured my back, knowing that I was done in competitive Street Fighter... I was trying to get back in the years of 2000, late 2007, and then most of 2008, I was trying to get back into being a gamer again. Instead of being all about competitive Street Fighter, which now I consider to be my past, I was all about moving forward positively into the future and doing something different. So I tried to reimmerse myself in games like Grand Theft Auto 4, Mass Effect, and stuff like that. In the fall of 2008, on a whim, I was actually inspired by people like the Angry Video Game Nerd and later on the Nostalgia Critic. Guys who literally had no production budget whatsoever, but just through sheer talent and, and being funny guys, were able to produce content for the internet that was incredibly popular. And I say, I feel like I'm a funny guy. People tell me all the time I am. I bet I could do something similar to that. It won't be exactly that because I want to play games and do live commentary to them. I didn't even know Let's Plays existed. I'd never even seen one before. I just started doing my own videos. I called them playthroughs. That's what I called them. I started using the term playthrough in 2008. I had never seen anyone use it before, but all of a sudden, years after I started using it, everyone else started saying that too. And I was like, but I was the first person to use it. I thought I had invented the term. Now, maybe I didn't, okay? I don't know. I'm just telling you from my perspective, this is what was happening. I didn't see someone else doing a Let's Play and I decided to jump on that bandwagon. I was doing something, in my opinion, was completely original and new. And the rest is history. Here we go. Obviously, he's a pretty bad driver, but uh, apparently they're all drunk. <laughs> There's no one's uh, shooting at Side note, during this time, there were two acceptable practices for recording gameplay footage for a Let's Play. The I like how he, he pauses to say side note, because basically he's going to announce why my, why my videos look like shit. Here we go. First was to use what's called a capture card, a device that allows video and audio to be recorded directly onto a computer from a video game console. A similar process could be done with a camcorder. The second was to simply point a camera at the screen right. and use the built-in microphone to capture voice and gameplay. Of these options, the former was far preferable, but viewing choices at the time were limited, and so some Let's Players used the latter method and found some success. It was The reason it wasn't widespread back then is because it was expensive to do to get a good capture card that would work with multiple consoles, and you needed a really good PC to handle the processing of doing it. It sounds stupid because you're like, I'm playing NES and I need a good PC. Yeah, back then you actually did. 
So it was easier to just play any game and point a camera and just fuck around. And I wasn't taking it seriously. For me, this was just a silly hobby to do. I'm enjoying games. I'll just film a few videos, toss them on the internet. I never intended that they would get popular. I didn't think anyone would watch them. But, man, did it turn out different. That's for sure. Okay. <clears throat> Philip originally began creating videos for Spider-Man Web of Shadows, I think. popularity. Though he was admittedly terrible at many of the games he played, yes. he often would play this off in a way that his viewers enjoyed, right. with off-color humor and a cocky personality. These viewers would often cite his authentic reactions as a reason for enjoying his content. Many others, however, considered his laugh grating and his humor obscene and dull, among other things. So, oh, let's hear the clip. Oh, come on. <laughs> you die so fucking quickly. Despite... So, yeah, in, back in the day when I first started on YouTube, my shtick was play a game and literally just kind of complain the whole time. Say the game sucks, say this part's stupid, rage the controls, oh, the controls suck, they're bad, and then when I fail, never blame myself. It was always, it's the game, which is exactly what I was doing in the Street Fighter community. I told you guys already, it was always, oh, I failed, I lost in a, in a match, oh, faulty computer error. The controls don't work on this cabinet. It's not my fault. That was my shtick, and I carried it over from Street Fighter to these videos to try to be entertaining. That was supposed to be kind of my hook. I was kind of like a cocky guy. Yes, I was a common gamer. I wasn't good at these games, but I was cocky and always infallible, and it was funny to watch me fail and laugh at my reaction. That was what I was going for back then. This, some of his videos would receive tens of thousands of views, a very high number especially during that time, and he would regularly appear on the front page of YouTube with footage of new games. Mm -hmm. On September 9th, 2009, he also mm. created a blog channel, which he called The King of Hate HD in all capital letters. This channel also began collecting considerable views on a small number of his frequent videos. Philip's pattern for video production was mostly consistent. He would play games in blocks of several hours, recording his playing session by placing a camera on a coffee table near the screen. Yep. Once he was finished... Or, when I, when I still lived with my parents, it was on a tripod in front of me, between me and the screen, blocking half the screen, so I'm trying to play a game and I can't even see because the camera's in the way, and it was a tiny, sweaty closet-sized bedroom that would heat up and be so stuffy because I had all this electronic equipment in there. I'm so glad that I got out of there within about a year of making content. I moved out and got a condo that was much better. <laughs> Playing, he would chop up the videos into approximately 10-minute segments and upload each of those segments onto his gaming channel individually. In April of 2000... That's false. I didn't chop anything up. I actually recorded 10-minute segments. As I've already told you guys, at the time, YouTube would not accept videos over 10 minutes long. So I would have the camera like right here in front of me, record, play, oh, 10 minutes. I'd actually was a timer on the camera to say how long you're going. And you would go stop, start, stop, start every 10 minutes. It was incredibly fucking tedious to do. But again, I wasn't editing videos. It was just based on recording in a camera. So I had to manually time the videos. And there were a few times when I would go too far. And then I did have to run the video through a video editor and it was a huge hassle. Because I'm already uploading so many videos a day. Now i got to edit one too. It was a major pain in the ass. So I did not do giant chunks of footage and cut it up actively. I actually recorded the 10 minutes and uploaded each file individually. So each day I was getting like dozens of files, hundreds of files some days. In 2010, Philip began to experience the first signs of trouble. Okay. Apparently, Ubisoft had seen some of Philip's gameplay footage of Splinter Cell Conviction and complained to the YouTube administrators who promptly shut down his channel out of fear of litigation. YouTube then contacted Ubisoft to verify the concern, but Ubisoft stated that they had made no such claim. In fact, it had been an anonymous internet user who had created a false account in an attempt to shut down Philip's YouTube channel, at least for a time. Why they wanted this is uncertain, but the channel was reinstated shortly after. So, this is completely true. This is what was le uh, then to be known as the Steve Jones Incident. It really was my first major run-in with copyright issues, although that's not entirely true. The year before, I tried to play Grand Theft Auto for the Lost and Damned DLC when it was first released, and apparently the videos got taken down by Rockstar. Now, I don't know if those were legit claims or not. I'll never know at this point. Um, but it was the next year when this happened, and this actually got my original Dark Side Field channel completely suspended because it hit multiple times. It wasn't like, oh, here's one strike. It was like, strike, 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 done. I was like, wow, and it shut the whole channel down. 
And now the only reason that we found out that it was a, uh, an impersonating troll was because I announced to the internet what was going on. I had that vlogging channel. I put a vlog up about it, and my fans started to investigate. The fans contacted Ubisoft's Twitter account. The Twitter account actually contacted people inside the company, and they looked into it and said, "Oh, yeah, we kind of this is this is not true at all. You know, this is we never did this." They contacted YouTube and said, "Why are you doing this on our behalf when it's not us? That's kind of messed up." And YouTube looked into it and said, oh, we didn't vet the claim. We just thought it was real. And then they changed it. Instead of saying, your video was taken down by Ubisoft, it said, your video was taken down by Steve Jones. I'll say it. I said it before and I'll say it again. Who the fuck is Steve Jones? And why was YouTube so stupid as to believe a blanket claim with zero corroboration? Back then... Fake copyright claims were very common and rampant on YouTube. It was so easy to fake a copyright claim and get something taken down, but a lot of people didn't know that, so it wasn't a rampant problem at the time. I was one of the people who was first starting to see these issues, okay? So yeah, Dark Side Phil got taken down because of this, and now he's going to talk about what happened as a result. As time went on, Philip uploaded more and more videos until he was reliably uploading over a dozen videos a day. Near the end of that year, he was laid off from his job, and so he established a Google AdSense account. He already, first of all, skipped a whole part. When that Steve Jones incident happened, um, I created DSP Gaming. That's the channel I'm on right now, and I've been since. So for 12 years, DSP Gaming has been the major source of my content on YouTube. I basically abandoned the Dark Side Phil channel because I was afraid it was never going to come back. Luckily, it actually did come back, but I never really had a use for it after that, okay? So, he did kind of gloss over that. I don't know why. It's kind of important considering DSP Gaming is my channel now, not Dark Side Phil, but okay. Anyway, he's about to say some stuff about AdSense that's also completely wrong. So, let's go back and, and restart this. More and more videos until he was reliably uploading over a dozen videos a day. Near the end of that year, he was laid off from his job, and so he established a Google AdSense account to start monetizing his videos. AdSense is the system that Google uses to distribute advertisements and pay content creators for their views and the number of times someone interacts with an ad or the video itself. Along with this, he started a new series on his blog channel in October of that year called DSP Tries It, where he would review food items and occasionally video game peripherals. Okay. So, even though he's well-intentioned, once again, Mr. Knudsen is incorrect. I did not open an AdSense account in 2010 to start monetizing anything. My AdSense existed for years before that. I always always had one. Um, <clears throat> so, um, I had monetized the King of Hate HD, my vlogging channel, since the day I basically opened it. Okay? I did basically just regular vlogs, like channel updates and me talking to the camera on that channel, and that was really it. I think there were some travel vlogs on that channel, too, that every once in a while I would make some money from, but nothing major. In fact, that channel existed for a year, monetized, and I think the most I ever made in a month was, like, a couple hundred bucks, if that. And what I told everyone was, hey, it's good if I make money on that channel, I'll use that to afford the games and things that I'm playing on my Dark Side Phil channel. So it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't a job for me. It wasn't even really much of a hobby. It was, I was doing a lot of videos and enjoying what I was doing. I liked the notoriety, but I was not making any money on AdSense at that time. But the AdSense was, was around for a long time. It had been over a year that the AdSense was on the King of Hate HD. Now you might say to yourself, wait a minute, why didn't you have AdSense on your Dark Side Phil channel where you had all your gameplay? Wouldn't you have made a lot of money on that? Yeah, except back then YouTube did not allow you to monetize gameplay. Back then, YouTube felt it was still a legal gray area, and rather than air, or rather than get sued, they wanted to err on the side of caution. And if you tried to monetize any gameplay videos, you would get rejected and say, no, it's gameplay rejection. It wasn't actually until 2010, 2011 that gameplay was able to be more commonly monetized. And that's actually one of the reasons why I ended up looking for a partner network, which we're going to get to very shortly in this video. But let's talk about this first. So, yes... On the King of Hate HD, I started doing a variety of vlogging, and then when I did lose my job in late 2010, my office job, which is what I was using to support myself, I started monetizing other kinds of videos on the King of Hate HD, including a new series called DSP Tries It right here. Uh, DA took me $1.50, and he's talking about a time machine being ready. I don't know what the fuck he's talking about, but thanks for the tip. Okay. Let's continue. 
these videos would also be monetized under his AdSense account. Right. Mm. Riveting. Riveting content. <laughs> but Philip would not have this revenue stream for long. Mm -hmm. Once his AdSense account was approved, he began requesting that his viewers interact with his videos more, strongly implying that viewers should click on ads in an effort to increase his revenue. What he wasn't aware of was that asking viewers to click on ads was disallowed in the contract for AdSense, and so his account was banned, meaning that he could no longer make money directly off of advertisements for any of his videos on any of his channels. Creating multiple ads... Oh, hold on. ...sense accounts is disallowed by the service, meaning that Philip could not monetize his videos. Unemployed and without income from YouTube, Philip began uploading his videos to Blip.tv, a competing video hosting service, and received... Okay, that is only half truth, okay? So, here's what really happened, okay? Let's go back a, a few frames here. Go to this, this is a good place to no pause longer. It, Okay, so, <clears throat> here's what really happened. The full story, in context, okay? So, I already had an AdSense account that existed since 2009, all right? On that the King of Hate HD channel, every video had been monetized. In fact, I had made a video to reveal my face for the very first time in 2009. And in that video, I talked about a lot of different things. Now, this was before I was ever attempting to make a living on YouTube. I still had my office job. I had no intentions of ever making a living on YouTube. But I remember specifically in that video, I said something that I should not have said. I said, if I'm paraphrasing here, hey, one way that you can really help me out, if you want to help me, you know, with the cost of the games that I'm buying to play on Dark Side Phil, is you can click on the ads on my videos. I remember specifically I said it. It's black and white. It's, you know, I said it in 2009. Yes, I shouldn't have done that. Absolutely, positively, 100%, it's documented. It happened. The video, I think, is still live somewhere, right? I think you can still see it somewhere. All right. So I'm not going to dispute that fact. All right. However, what Mr. Nudson is saying is that in late 2010, my AdSense account was deactivated. Actually, he says it was completely removed or canceled. All right. As a result of me asking my viewers to click on the ads. Okay. This is incorrect. I'm going to tell you exactly what happened. All right. I had had ads on my videos all 2009 and 2010 on the King of HD. I had said what I said at the beginning of 2009 in that video. YouTube didn't care. People mass reported the video. YouTube didn't care. Do you want to know why YouTube didn't care? Because it didn't result in any ridiculous over the top clicking of ads anywhere. It didn't. It just didn't equate to anything like that. Okay? So because of that, YouTube didn't give a shit. They're like, whatever. Yeah, technically it's a violation and we could get them in trouble or we could take it away, but they didn't. They said, whatever, we're just going to let it ride. It's not a big deal. Now, when I lost my job in late 2010, I started a catchphrase that I said in all of my videos. Watch, rate, and participate. Back then there has a rating system where it was stars. It wasn't thumbs up, thumbs down. Just so you guys know, that's what rate meant. It wasn't like, like it is today. So when I started saying this in all my videos, hey, Thanks a lot, guys. If you want to support, please watch, rate, and participate. That's as far as it ever went. Never once did I say anything about ads at all, okay? Of course, some people would say things, hey, does it hurt if, you t if I use ad blocker when I watch your videos? And I would outright say, yes, it does. Please don't. If you support me, please don't have an ad blocker on, okay? But I never outright asked for that. After the initial time that I erroneously said it in 2009, it never happened again because people caught me out for it. And I was like, oh, shit, I got to watch what I say. You know, I want to be able to make this supplemental income to afford games and things. I got to be careful. I don't want that taken away from me. All right. Well, here's what happened. I got laid off from my job in October. At that point, I was super popular on YouTube. People actually liked me. <laughs> Figure that out. Right. People actually liked me a decade ago. Now people hate my guts. So because they liked me. They saw me as an underdog. Well, this isn't fair. Why'd Phil lose his job? He didn't do anything wrong. We want to support him. We like the content he puts out on YouTube. Let's support him in droves and see what we can do to help. So when I said things like watch, rate, and participate, people took it as, oh, 
Go click the living shit out of Phil's videos. Click the ads. And that's what happened. In the months of November and December of 2010, my ad revenue went from like $200 a month to, you ready for this? That first month, I made $18,000 just on vlogs. Yes. Holy fucking shit. Yes, I know. That's jaw dropping. I was like, this is insane. I showed it to my parents. I showed it to my friends. I was like, this can't possibly be sustainable. Like, there's no way that I could possibly keep making this much money doing YouTube. This is insane. And by the way, no, I didn't. It wasn't sustainable. But it was insane, the amount of money that I made. Okay? Then, the next month. By the way, I never got contacted by YouTube or anything saying, oh, something's wrong. Everything seemed fine. So, December, I keep just putting out gameplay videos that are not monetized, but only doing vlogs on, D on the King of Hate HD. They're all monetized. The King of Hate HD already is making, within not even half the month had passed yet in December. And I had made another $13,000. Okay? So within two months, over 30 grand. All right? This is insane. There's no way this is going to continue. I'll be rich. I'll be filthy rich for the rest of my life if this continues. Right? Mid-December, I get a message from YouTube. Dear Mr. Burnell, we have detected invalid clicking activity on your videos. Therefore, as a result of said activity, we are suspending. We're not turning off. We're not completely removing. We are suspending your AdSense account. However, it was an indefinite suspension. And what that means is I didn't know if or when they were ever going to turn my AdSense account back on. I, it, there was no chance anytime soon, obviously. There was no appeals process or anything like that. It was just, it's done. You're screwed. You can't make any more money on your videos on YouTube anymore. Okay? So, a lot of people at that time, of course, my trolls in particular, said things like, well, Phil, the reason that you lost ad revenue is because you idiotically asked people to click the ads of your videos. False. That was something that happened in early 2009. I had already been making videos for over a year and a half and never had an issue with it. It wasn't until I lost my job, people felt bad for me and started going crazy trying to help me out way too much that YouTube said, this can't possibly be valid. And then they basically took it away from me. Okay. So I will admit I made the mistake. I absolutely did. But the way that people like to phrase this, oh, it's because Phil did it directly. No, that's actually not what happened at all. It ended up happening because people were supporting me so much, so much overly supporting that I got basically kind of screwed out of the program. If people had done it much more reasonably, maybe it wouldn't have been a big deal. But people thought, let's just help them as much as possible, right? And it basically backfired, all right? By the way, shout out to the UPS guy who tipped me $5. I've been watching you for years. Unfortunately, it slowed down because of work, but I'll always be a fan. I appreciate the shit out of you. You're the man and a legend. The best. Love you. By the way, we all know you have great karate skills and you could actually win any fight. <laughs> uh, even as much as I would like to think that maybe I could have won a one-on-one -on -one fight, I don't think I would have been able to defeat both Jaha and Mike Watson at the same time. I would have gotten stomped. I'm just saying. Just making that official. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, Check out the video about Street Fighter that was part one of this DSP Reacts, okay? Okay. What a transition. All right, so. Mostly true, but a little untrue, and I just wanted to clarify that situation. And by the way, I will emphasize my AdSense was suspended, okay? I'm going to emphasize that for good reason. All right, let's continue. Or ...make money directly off of advertisements for any of his videos on any of his channels. Creating multiple AdSense accounts is disallowed by the service, meaning that, is that true. Philip could not monetize his videos. Unemployed and without income from YouTube, Philip began uploading his videos to Blip.tv, a competing video hosting service, and received a lucrative partnership offer. And not lucrative. It was basically the same as anyone else. When you sign up for their partnership there, you make a set amount of money per ad played on a video. It was less than what YouTube was actually uh, paying for kind of their AdSense, but it was still going to be a good amount of money for the popularity that I was going to get there. 
few months after he began using Blip, however, he was banned from the site for making numerous anti-Semitic jokes. Right. This is what Here happens is. when you let the Jews do whatever they want. <laughs> You've let the Jews overrun space, and now look at this. Hello, Jew. Give me your money. You wanted it for far too long. Why are you carrying your balls next to you? You stupid moron. You big-nosed freak. <laughs> Rejected from Blip. Certainly, I'm not going to say it never happened. It did. Um, and in fact, there were two different times that I did this, and I've never revealed this either. There were two different times when I did this same line of joking. Once was just right before this, um, when I was actually playing uh, X Men. I think it was X Men, uh, like like co op or something. I was doing it was the X Men side scrolling beat em up, and I was making jokes about uh, Magneto being Jewish, which is really bad. And then I did this. This is the Dead Space 2 demo. This was the demo of the game, okay? This was 2010, by the way. This is 12, 12 years ago. And the reason that I did it, it's not justifiable, it's not defendable. It's just not, okay? It's bad. I should have never done it. I'm embarrassed that I did it. I've apologized numerous times over the years for doing it. And I've promised all of you, I will never do that ever again. Okay. At the time, to put this into reference and context, I was a big fan of Howard Stern. I actually had a Sirius Satellite Radio before it was even Sirius XM. I had Sirius Satellite Radio and I used to listen to Howard Stern and he used to play his archived shows all the time. And he used to have characters on there who pretended like they were Nazis or just German in general, they would talk just like this. They would make these particular style of jokes. He had a whole show called Guess the Jew, where there were three people in the studio. Or no, I take it back. They would name three celebrities. And you had to guess out of the three celebrities which one had changed their name from being Jewish sounding to something not Jewish sounding and find out who's the real Jew. All right? And there was a guy who was pretending to be a Nazi on the show making all these very bad, bad jokes about Jews, okay? So at the time, I was, you know, a fan of this kind of stuff, and I thought it was fine. I was very stupid. I, at this point, by the way, and I'll, I'll say this too, back then, 12 years ago, especially in the Street Fighter community, all right, using words like rape, gay, these were words... And of course, words I'm not going to say, the F word, okay? These were words that were used commonly, just thrown out there. And no one was offended. And it was just common speak at the time. Now, obviously, things change over time, right? And for me, you know, I, I, you'll even, if you look at my old content from 2008, 2009, you'll hear me using words like that, right? I do. I, I'll right admit it. I did back then. Um, it, I, it wasn't until afterward that people educated me. And said, Phil, this is not acceptable. Maybe it was acceptable in your circles and Street Fighter or whatever, and your friend. It's just not acceptable in society. You have to stop with this stuff, okay? And these jokes in particular, of course, today, I watch myself at this and I'm like, wow, these were absolutely positively awful. There's, it's indefensible. At that time, I defended it. If you can believe it, in 2010, I defended this humor. And I said, ah, oh, it ain't that bad. It's not offensive. Howard Stern does it. I can do it too. No. I don't. Number one, I don't think I'm Howard Stern or I'm, I'm funny enough or good enough to do the things he did. And number two, even then you could argue that he doing it was wrong, right? So it, it's there's no justification whatsoever. Zero. I defended it back then. Since then, I've completely changed my tune. I know the error of my ways. I would never do this kind of shit ever again. But here's what happened. I got reported, all right? I got reported on Blip for inappropriate content. At the time, I was the biggest gamer on Blip, and I was the second biggest guy on the site. I had left YouTube and come to Blip, and within two weeks of being on Blip TV, I had overtaken everyone else except the Nostalgia Critic. I was bigger than Angry Joe at the time, okay? And Blip came to me and said, holy shit, you are so popular, we want to make you an offer. We're going to get you in a better contract. We want to work with you. 
to grow and promote your content here on the site. We basically want Blip TV to be the destination for dark side filled content on the internet, and we're going to heavily promote you and everything. I had a meeting with the guys from That Guy with the Glasses. That's the company that's owned by Doug Walker, the nostalgia critic. I talked to his brother, Rob Walker, on the phone. Actually, I take it back. I think it was a Skype call, actually. And we had a big conversation that I was going to be part of them. They were going to bring me in as the biggest gamer in the group. I was going to put out content under their umbrella. They were going to put it on the site, thatguywiththeglasses.com. I was going to have my own page there. And they were going to promote it. And I was going to start, uh, apparently, I was going to start having crossovers and appearances with all of their content. Okay? Within one month of me being on Blip, this happened. Blip contacts me one night and says, tomorrow we're going to have a call where we're going to talk about your future. It's going to be great. The future is bright. Then they were alerted to this being present on the site. They called me the next day and said, the call is off. You're gone. Remove all your content in three days. You're banned. No recourse. No opportunity to apologize, to explain myself, to say I'll never do it again. They felt that this was so egregious. They threw me off their business entirely and said, go away, never come back. Okay? Now, do I disagree with this? Yes. Obviously, I, I wish that they would have given me a chance to understand why this was wrong and say, don't ever do this again and we'll let you stay. This is a big no-no. In fact, if they had even argued that I had to make a public, public apology, I probably would have. Okay? But they were like, nope, you're gone. Zoop! They pulled the cord and I was gone immediately blacklisted from anyone involved with Blip. That guy with the glasses never contacted me or responded to anything I sent them ever again. Like they wanted nothing to do with me. <laughs> okay. Wow. I mean, yeah, it does look really bad. It's bad. I shouldn't have done it. I mean, this is one of the worst things I've ever done right here. And I own up to it that now I admit it's terrible. I should have never done it. It's stupid as fuck. I'm a complete bone-headed idiot. I was so dumb back then. And by the way, back then, again, I never really saw any of this to think that this was serious. Like, I thought everything I do on the internet's a joke. It doesn't matter, right? I wasn't making a living doing it anyway. It's not a big deal. When I started making that YouTube funny money those first two months with AdSense, I was like, this is ridiculously preposterous, right? Um, you know, I never took it seriously. So I was just an idiot. Today, things are obviously very, very different, and I totally regret this, okay? But what happened happened. It's history. Oh, let's switch back. By the way, about 50 minutes left till my food arrives. Can't wait to try that Thai food. Stop dancing on my own face! And AdSense, and with limited employment opportunities, Philip was suddenly in deep financial trouble going yep. into 2011. Completely in March, true. however, Philip was approached by Machinima Incorporated, a company that contracts content creators chiefly for gaming videos to become a managed partner. By allowing Machinima to place advertisements on his videos under their AdSense account rather than his, he could continue making money through videos on YouTube as a full-time career. Okay, so I created two new channels on YouTube. The first channel is called DSP Gaming. This is my active channel for video game playthroughs. On the other side, if you're a really big fan of fighting games and competitively playing these games, you're going to want to head over to my channel DSP Street Fighter. It's actually looking like this is going to work out. And this is going to be something I'm going to be able to do as a full-time occupation, at least for the short term. And as long as this works out over the next course of this year, it may be something I can do in the long term, which is excellent. So, despite Phillips' op Okay. So for some clarity here and some additional information, this is actually not how it happened. What happened was, of all things, I had an internet beef with a major content creator who actually worked for Machinima. His name was Hutch. I don't know if he still makes content to this day. Maybe he does. He was known for Call of Duty content, okay? Now, what happened was I was doing a series at this time where people would ask me questions and I would answer them, you know, to the best of my knowledge, which was mostly off the cuff and completely uninformed, and I said a lot of stupid things back then. One of the questions that was asked of me had something to do with Hutch and somehow... It resulted in me insulting him or saying something that he took as an insult. Now, I actually don't remember what it was at all. I have no recollection what it actually was that was said, but he got really pissed with me. And he contacted me behind the scenes and we had it out, all right? Come to find out, once we actually started talking, we are actually kind of cool with each other. We understood each other's perspective. I apologized to him and said, I didn't really mean to insult you. I'm sorry if it came off that way. I was, you know, kind of doing stuff completely stupidly uninformed or whatever. And 
basically we squashed the beef all right now that was early that was like early to mid 2010 all this shit happens to me i lose my job i lose my adsense i get kicked off blip tv it's like i have nowhere else to fucking go all right on a whim i contacted hutch and i was like dude do you have any idea because you're in the industry do you have any idea who i could maybe talk to or point me in the right direction of someone who might have something to do with anything because i'm at an all-time low at this point and i don't know really what i'm going to do to support myself because i can't find another job similar to what i had at that point jobs in connecticut where i lived in the state of connecticut uh were very bad it was a very bad time for the, the job market and I knew I would probably have to get two or three part-time jobs to even pay enough to keep my condo. It was going to be rough. So I basically contacted Hutch and I was like, hey man, any ideas? Just so happens Hutch was working for Machinima and he said, he literally emails my email to Machinima. He says, head of partnerships, here's Phil. He's incredibly popular on YouTube. He's got a great audience who supports him. Let's strike a deal. And the rest was history because they did strike a deal with me to put their ads on my video. So now for the first time, instead of only having advertisements on my vlogs on the King of Hate HD, I was able to put advertisements on all different channels. DSP Gaming had gameplay that was monetized. The King of Hate HD had vlogs that was monetized. And later on, I changed that to a new channel called the King of Hate Vlogs. And then on top of that, I made a new channel called DSP Street Fighter, where I put all fighting game coverage. Why three channels? Because as I've already explained back then, videos could only be 10 minutes long. And I was uploading so many videos a day that if I uploaded fighting game footage, a, a full video game playthrough over here, first person shooter here, vlogs here, if you upload all that to one channel, it would all get lost in the mix because you're uploading so many videos at once. Ah, but by separating into three channels and branding them separately, now people could go to each channel for that style of content and not be inundated with everything else. It was an interesting business strategy. Yes, it is all Hutch's fault that I ever had my gameplay monetized on YouTube. Let's continue. Optimism, things would not stay so simple for long. Over the course of 2011, Philip would find more and more viewers, but many of his older fans would begin to sour towards him. By this point, many other Let's Players had joined the scene, uploading their own gameplay with capture cards and screen capture applications. Compared to Philip's camera method, these other recording styles provided far higher quality of both video and audio. But even the hardcore fans who were used to his camera recording method were finding frustration with his attitude. Though it's difficult to gauge a precise widespread response, many commenters would complain about his inflated ego and his habit of blaming the game rather than himself an inordinate amount. When competing with others in online games, he would always degrade his opponent. If he won, he would profess his opponent's lack of skill, and if he lost, he would accuse the opponent of illegitimate tactics, or he would complain of faulty controls. That's called cheating, and that's what everyone does online, which is why you shouldn't fucking play online. Yet you keep asking for me to do it, so I gotta do what my fans want, so hope you enjoyed this real shit-fest session I had tonight. Okay, what the fuck? <laughs> I wanted to pause it right there. Look what we get—a big face. Uh, can I rewind one frame? I don't think I can. Okay, I right, do online, which is why you wanted to pause right there. Because I have a couple things to say about this. So first of all, <clears throat> what a face. First of all, um, I 100% agree on the direct capture thing. I back then, so we're talking 11 years ago now, was a stubborn, obstinate, pig-headed very very hard to convince to change kind of person my opinion of myself was well i'm putting out content it's getting tons of views it's making money so who are you to criticize me or even suggest that i change my methods or my style in any way shape or form all right because if i do that i'm basically abandoning those who have supported me all this way and by changing to something different okay now, what I didn't understand at the time, all right, was that even though you're successful, success cannot last forever. O over time, what you have to do is you have to adapt and you have to change for the better. You can't just be the same person, the same content creator. That's one of the reasons why I'm doing this React video right now is to broaden my horizons to a different style of content and bring in a variety of support and a variety of views, you see? I can't just do gameplay all day anymore. I know that, right? I gotta change for the better. 
But I remember particularly back then, some people started contacting me saying, Phil, you know, you got a lot of competition. People who are playing Street Fighter and your Street Fighter videos don't look that good compared to theirs anymore. You know, Phil, you're playing this game and man, there's a lot of dark contrasts in it. Your camera doesn't pick them up very well. It looks really shitty. It would be great if you would adopt direct capture. And I would be like, no, 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 no. I would start freaking out like, oh, that's the wrong one. No, no, no. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I was really, in some cases, I would get angry at people just for suggesting improvement. And that was really stupid. All right. Now, I don't know if it was because I was cocky, I don't know if it's because, yes, back then I still was drinking way too much. And basically at night, I had a lot of issues. Let's put it that way. Like I had a lot of issues in my head about things that in my life were kind of fucked up at the time. Um, and certainly having a bunch of things happen, like being kicked off blip and being called a racist and things like that, kind of extrapolated the situation in my head. My head was not very clear back then. Let's just put it that way. It was kind of a whirlwind. It was like, wake up, record a ton of videos, upload the videos, record a ton of videos, upload the videos, wolf down bad fast food, record a ton of videos, upload the videos, drink, 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 pass out drunk. That's not a good lifestyle. Just so you guys know, that's really fucking bad. You know, you, that, <laughs> my God, I can't, sometimes I, I, I'm shocked I'm still alive when I look back at those days. I really do. I believe, you know, and I think that's why I was like that. Because if I was more... Like today, I'm more interactive with you guys. We have a better relationship. We talk. I listen to your feedback. I do a lot of improvements based on it. I, I appreciate that you guys like me and my content enough that you want to contribute to the continued success of this channel. Back then, it was like, it's all on me. Constant. All the time. Put out content. Make money. Do it. Just do it. Fuck everything else. Ignore everything around you. Just do it. <sighs> And I do believe that's the beginning of when people started to turn against me. I would agree with Frederick here. Probably around 2011, 2012. The two years where things really made a turn for the worse. And some opinions started to turn against me. Basically, I was being made fun of. I was being called a dinosaur by people. My contemporaries. Oh, Dark Side Phil, that old, that old fart. That guy's still using a camera. Pointing at his fucking TV. What a jerk, right? What a jackass. Now, the shtick of me always blaming the games. That was the shtick. All right, and we, I would still, to this day, I, you got to understand, I still do that to some extent every once in a while. Yes, that's the shtick. It's kind of the thing that's funny that I joke and I always say, ah, it was never me or whatever, right? That's part of my thing that still to this day resonates with my audience. I'm never going to just completely drop that. Then I would be like a completely different person. You're not watching Dark Side Phil anymore, you know? But at the same time, I totally get it that some people got tired of it. It was the, sta the same shtick. With no variation, no improvement, it got stagnant. And that I will completely agree with. Now, this video clip that we're looking at <clears throat> is infamous. Do you guys ever see this match? Wonder Waffle? This guy, the reason why I got so mad at this guy, and again, this is an infamous clip. I'm not surprised that Frederick Knudsen sampled it, but it's actually not a good example. This is an exception. So when Street Fighter IV first launched, okay, they had different modes you could play it in online. There was a casual mode. I think it was called like player matches. But then there was a mode that was supposed to be seriously competitive called ranked matches. When you won or lost these matches, you either gained or lost ranking points. All right? And the ranking points determined your rank in the game and you would unlock things as you got higher ranks. You would play better players. People actually touted online, look at my high rank, right? When the game launched, they screwed it all up. They made it so that you could change the game settings in a ranked match. Now, at the time, there was an established thing. Like, for example, everyone thought it was 99 seconds, best two out of three rounds. These were tournament-established rules for competitive matches, okay? When you played ranked matches, 99% of the time, people had those as the default rules, but you could change them. This guy, Wonder Waffle, actually abused the rules to get cheap wins and get a high ranking in the game. Here's what he did. First of all, he turned the time limit to only 30 seconds, meaning you had to win really fast because time was running out. Then he picked an abusable character, Ken, who has a dragon punch, a special move that's incredibly overpowered in this version of the game. If you just keep like mashing the move out, it'll come out and interrupt a ton of moves in the game. But this guy also created lag in the game by actually doing, what, what do they call it? Um, There's a word for it. 
He would create artificial lag in the game to make it lag so you couldn't react to anything he did. So literally, he would turn on... Oh, lag switch. It's called a lag switch. He would... The game would be perfectly unlaggy. Fight. All of a sudden, he'd walk forward. Insane lag. You can't control the game anymore. And here's what would happen. Dragon punch. Dragon punch. Dragon punch. Dragon punch. Dragon punch. Dragon punch. It was so laggy, you couldn't react to it. You only had 30 seconds. Once you got hit by one to two dragon punches, you didn't even have time to come back. So he got a super high rank in Street Fighter 4 cheating. But there was no way to solve it or fix it, okay? Now, what's funny about this is that people always made fun of me when I made this one video against this guy because I raged so bad at him. I really tore him a new butthole. Like, oh, this guy's a piece of shit, and this is what's bad about the game, but you guys keep wanting me to play online, so here it is, right? Well, later on that year, I went to a tournament in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I was helping someone run the tournament. And... This person, who I don't know, comes up to me and says, Hey, are you Dark Side Phil? And I was like, Yeah, I'm Dark Side Phil. Why? What, what of it? What's going on? You need anything? You, you know, did you miss your match? You need some help? He goes, Oh, no, I just want to let you know I'm Wonder Waffle. Now, I'm in the middle of running a tournament, and I don't particularly remember anything about this guy because this is the funny part about being a content creator, all right? You guys see the notable moments happen. You document them. And you repeat them and watch them over and over. They become memes. They become epic moments that you guys will remember forever. The Wonder Waffle match was an epic moment that people talked about on the internet for a long time. It happened once to me, and I never remembered it ever again. Only if people brought it up over time would anyone ever even say to me, Hey, the Wonder Waffle match. Like, oh yeah, I remember it happened. You know, not a big deal to me. But you guys remembered it so this guy actually comes up to me at a tournament and says hi i'm wonder waffle now i don't know what he was expecting me to do but it didn't even like resonate in my head i didn't know i was like oh okay hi nice to meet you and i shook his hand and i walked away and it was later that night i was sitting in the hotel room after everything and i was just thinking about that weird interaction i had with that guy and i was like it sounds familiar and i actually went on my laptop, because I used to take my laptop to, to tournaments back then, I went online, I searched, and there it was. DSP versus Wonder Waffle. I was like, I wonder if that's really the guy. <laughs> it might have been. It might have been that he was trying to get some kind of, I don't know, a rise out of me by meeting me in person. Or maybe it was just someone who was full of shit and lying and it wasn't really them. I guess I'll never know, because the guy never came back and said anything to me the next day or anything. But it's just funny how stuff works. But anyway, yeah... This was a situation, infamous situation in my history where I raged at a Street Fighter player for basically cheating. It's funny that he's pulling this out of context saying that's this is just what I did all the time. I mean, in reality, yes, I did rage and make fun of people online all the time. Again, that was my online persona. That was my whoops. That was my shtick. That's what I was doing to be popular on YouTube. And it was getting tired and people were getting tired of me. Okay. You shouldn't fucking play online. Yet you keep asking for me to do it. So I gotta do what my fans want, so hope you enjoyed this real shit fest session I had tonight. This last complaint may have merit, as his temper would often manifest as abuse of his equipment. This is fucking bullshit! Now that's ridiculous. Move, asshole! That is, that is definitely not something that happened all the time. I would get angry at games, yes, all the time, but I wouldn't abuse my equipment constantly. That's completely false. In fact, I usually took really good care of my equipment. I was the guy who was known as nothing really, you know, ever breaks. And if it did, it was a rarity. There's two times ever where I remember distinctly something breaking. One of them, I was playing a God of War game. I think it was either God of War 3 or God of War Judgment. And there was a, a gauntlet of enemies that I was fighting. And I got so angry because I remember the controller was not responding. And I slammed it on my coffee table so hard, I broke it. And it stopped working after that. I was like, oh shit, I totally broke the controller. I said it on camera and everything. But this case, you can say, oh, is this, there's, this is part of a controller slam compilation. This was a case where the game completely glitched. I was playing the game, a big segment of it. It was a big story segment. And all of a sudden, the camera froze right here, and I couldn't move the character. That character on the right-hand side there, I think Norman Jaden is his name, he's supposed to be walking through the nightclub. He wouldn't move at all. He was completely bugged out and frozen, and you couldn't make progress in the game. And it wasn't once or twice. Like, I kept restarting, and it kept happening. So I got progressively more and more angry 
to the point where I got so upset, I started slamming things. I was so pissed. I was like, I want to play the game. I love the game. What's going on with this game? But that wasn't representative of what I did all the time. It was only in extreme cases where I'd be like completely slamming shit. And what's funny is you can say, oh, but Phil, there's a controller slam montage, okay? I've made content for 14 years. Don't you think when I make content 8 to 10 hours a day for 14 years, maybe there's a few times I slam my controller? That doesn't mean it happened all the time. If you had showed me 14,000 times in 14 years that I'd slam my controller, I'd be like, damn, that guy's got a problem. But again, this is the internet trying to take something out of context and pretending like it's something that happens all the time and acting like that's a fact. Yes, my detractors over the years said this is what Phil does all the time. So Frederick Knudsen watches the montage of it and believes this is Phil all the time. That was a rarity when I would be slamming stuff like that. Swearing like a, a sailor absolutely all the time. Slamming my equipment very rarely. Except my mouse today because my mouse only works when I slam it. Okay. would also become belligerent on his social media. For example, when game reviewer Mitch Dyer oh, posted no. a review for IGN with which he disagreed, he attacked Dyer for not providing an objective review, and after the argument, Philip posted a vlog onto his King of Hate HD YouTube channel attacking Oh my god, further. look at me! And he just got all offended that, like, I told him that I work full time. Look at me in this video. Like, okay, jealous much? That's what I should say. Jealous much? So, first of all, I just gotta fucking respond. Look at me in this video! Holy fucking shit. Look how puffy my hair is. Look at how thick and dark my goatee is. <laughs> Things have definitely changed in over 10 years, right? I could never even grow a beard like that if I wanted anymore. You wouldn't be able to see it because it's all white hairs, you know? But anyway, wow, I look totally different today. Um, At least from this clip. Um, But anyway, this was the situation. This was the beginning of me having an issue with the games media, all right? And I, this is a running theme with me over the years as a content creator. I've always been at odds with the mainstream games media because I feel that they have hidden under the guise of, hey, a review is just an opinion, man. So we can literally say whatever we want, say whatever game is good or bad, and we can never be held accountable for what we're saying because it's just my opinion. Okay? Ladies and gentlemen, my response to that is as follows. Bullshit. Bull fucking Shit. That is a terrible thing to say. To think that you are in a prominent role in the games media. You're supposed to be reviewing a game for the public to know if they want to play it or not. And you just completely misrepresent the game, don't even understand it, throw out a crappy review that's very poorly done, and now I have no right to criticize you because it's your opinion? Are you crazy? Are you stupid? Yes, they're both. They actually act like that. They think that they can just do that shit, okay? In this case, this is Mitch Dyer. This guy was a freelance writer who was taken on by IGN to do some freelance articles. Eventually, they hired him full-time, and then he literally botched thing after thing at over there. I don't know if he still works there, but it was just a comedy of errors with this guy, okay? But this guy wrote an article, a review, of a game called Double Dragon Neon, all right? For those who've never played the game, Double Dragon Neon was supposed to be an homage to the old-school side-scrolling beat-em-up games of the 1980s. It's supposed to play like old-school Double Dragon. Like, literally, that's what it was designed to be. Now, did it have modernized visuals and a few modernized improvements? Yes. But for the most part, the game was meant to be an homage. Imagine if there was a game called Super Mario Classic, and it played like original Super Mario Brothers. That's essentially Double Dragon Neon. Mitch Dyer reviews the game a 3 out of 10. His major criticism of the game, oh, it plays like an old game, and I don't like those old style of games. It should have been more modernized. 3 out of 10. Dude, the game was made to be a throwback homage. That's the point of the game. Okay, you don't like it. If you don't like old games, why are you reviewing it? That's like saying, I know I hate Chinese food, but today I'm going to order Chinese and review it and say it all sucks. Like, what are you, fucking stupid? And this was a terrible representation of the game. It was ridiculously bad. It was unfair that he did that to the game. I felt bad that he misrepresented the game the way he did in his review. So I call him out on social media for it, and he literally dodges everything and says, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Because the moment I confronted him with something that scared him and made him look like he was in the wrong, he ran away. 
and over the years, people confronted him about me over and over, and basically, he's, ah, Dark Side feels that asshole. I'm not dealing with that guy. No, no, no. And that's how he was. And that's what I mean. Like, again, did I have a very defensive demeanor on social media? Yes. Did I sometimes lash out at people on social media? Yes. I will absolutely positively admit those things. But another bad example, that Mitch Dyer example is terrible. That was a guy who was actually a jackass doing a disservice to a game, completely misunderstood what it was supposed to be and rated it poorly, which might hurt the game's sales because he's reviewing it for IGN, one of the big giant gaming media outlets. And I'm supposed to just say, oh, I, I have no right to criticize this guy because it's just his opinion, man. It's like, no, fuck that. I called him out, and rightly so. And, you know, you know, I, I have no idea, again, what happened. Obviously, he didn't really get any negative consequences. He got hired full-time by IGM and just continued to fuck things up over and over. Go figure. A couple shout-outs here. Snow Carl tipped a dollar fifty, and says... Super interesting take. It actually really changed my perspective on some issues. Uh, would you? What would you say is the biggest difference between old and new Phil in your opinion? What's changed? <clears throat> my ability to see from other people's perspectives. My ability to listen to feedback and try to weigh and balance it instead of just immediately dismiss dismissing it all. And basically now being very careful about the kind of things I say and realize that now what I say has weight because I could say something that really hurts someone. Back then I didn't care. Back then I really didn't give two shits. I was like, oh, well, if you're offended, you're just a sissy. That's how, that was my mentality back then. And that was completely false. I should have never been like that. I should have been more open-minded and sensitive to what I was saying and doing, realizing that what I said had weight and power because I had clout on the internet. And, you know, I really hurt a lot of people back then, I feel. And I, I, I hope at least people would believe that I'm not like that anymore, okay? Uh, double O tipped me a dollar fifty, and he says... Do you, do you remember in an E3 recap you did about Killer Instinct that Mitch Dyer covered? We all learned in real time during that re recap, Mitch Dyer completely misreported the entire game's unlocking process. Yes, I remember that. M Mitch Dyer tipped $1.50 and says, Mitch Dyer left IGN, then he went on and started writing for games, including Star Wars Squadrons, Battlefront 2, and now he's written a part of Gotham Knights. Well, I never played Star Wars Squ Squadrons, can't comment on that. Battlefront 2 didn't really have a story. So I don't know what he wrote there. And Gotham Knights isn't out yet. So I guess I can't really comment on his writing. But I can tell you his reporting and reviewing is shit. The Crunchiest Onion tipped the dollar fifty says, I don't think Mitch Dyer is a good example for nuts in the use regarding your Twitter behavior at the time. I think your old tweets about Minecraft, yes. And people who play Minecraft, yes. Would have been much better examples of what he's trying to show. That I will 100% fess up to. Back in the day, I had this bug up my ass about... Any game that got viral popularity, I felt it didn't deserve it. So Minecraft was a prime example of this. This was a game that looked kitty. It looked like pixelated graphics, silly things. You're building, there's sheep. And I always argued that the game looked like a kid's game. And I can't understand why that game is the biggest game in gaming. At one time it was, not anymore. At one time it literally was the biggest game in gaming. Okay? And I would say really dumb things that were unqualified statements because I had never played it. Okay, I would insult outright insult people who played Minecraft, saying you're dumb, you're like a, you're childlike mind, you're you're an idiot, you know you're immature. Like why would you play that shit? Why when there's many better games out there? Then years later, I played Minecraft and I'm an idiot. You know, I'm I, it's a great game. It's fucking really good. It's a really great game for multiple levels of reasons. It's a really great game. The building is addictive and fun. It's got a chill atmosphere. It's got a feeling of survival. But once you actually build your own, you know, ability to survive and be self-sustainable, it's actually really neat. The, the, the engine, what you can do with that engine is absolutely... I just keep dancing over my own face. What you can do with that engine is outstanding. The world is open and so much content to explore. There's alternate dimensions you can go into. The game is outstanding. It's a cultural phenomenon for a good reason, and I just sat there crapping on it for years like a fucking idiot because I refused to play it. I was a moron, you know? And that would have been a great example of what Nudson's trying to say here. Sadly, that's not the example he used. All right, let's continue, guys. I almost choked there. <coughs> Excuse me. Here we go. But anyway... He also would attack other YouTubers, notably PewDiePie, iJustine, and Tobuscus, each for different reasons. While his former fans... I mean, that's true. Some were really stupid and others were warranted. Like, iJustine never said a negative word about me and I attacked her. 
saying really nasty, nasty, disgusting things about her that I never should have said. And I feel really bad about that. And I apologize for that because that I never should have done. Um, it wasn't my place. I always had this issue with people who I felt were doing gaming on YouTube just to make money. For example, Tobuscus was supposed to be a guy who made comedic songs. All of a sudden, now you can make gameplay videos. And now he's making gameplay videos for money because you can monetize them now. He never did it before. But as soon as he can make a buck doing it, oh, he's a hardcore gamer and he's going to play all the games. And he was getting gaming sponsorships and all kinds of shit. There were Tobuscus ads running on my fucking YouTube videos. My competitor had an advertisement advertising his channel on my video. How is that acceptable? So I called him out for it. He apologized and then never followed up. And then he went down his own fucking rabbit hole with all kinds of fucked up stuff he did. And no one even talks about him anymore. I Justine, I'll be honest with everyone. I never understood the appeal. I don't think she's an informed person on games and never was. She was someone who was doing like vlogs and other kind of content for the internet first. And again, as soon as gaming became profitable because you can monetize gameplay, she's a gamer and she's gaming. And now she's somehow a notable person in gaming. Admittedly, I said terrible things about her. I never should have said the terrible things I said about her. She never said a negative word about me. I said bad things about her. I'm 100% in the wrong. I apologize to iJustine and anyone else over the years who I may have offended with saying dumb shit like that. I never should have said shit like that, okay? Um, PewDiePie, I don't really necessarily think that we have real anger towards each other. I think that he's someone who referenced me early on in his early content. Then he blew up and became ridiculously popular. And I made fun of him over the years for basically being a guy who screamed at a camera and got popular for doing that. Back then, I was jealous. Absolutely. Back then, I'm like, here's a guy who was inspired likely by me because he was talking about me and his own content and videos. He actually, there's, there's record, historical record. He liked my videos on YouTube back in the day. And then he went on to be insanely rich and famous while I just kind of stagnated and declined. So I got jealous and I got pissed and I said nasty things about him. He said nasty things about me too over the years as well. So we've had a little back and forth. I personally don't think that either of us really care or hate about each, hate each other or anything like that. But yes, from an outsider's perspective, this is true. It seemed like I was picking fights with people who were bigger than me. Why is Phil doing this instead of minding his own business? I totally understand this point. Okay. Claim that this was a change in character, Phillips detractors would point to these things as already existing issues becoming more evident. In light of these problems, Phillips' viewership, and therefore his livelihood, began slipping. Between November of 2011 and April of 2012, he would drop from nearly 13.5 million monthly views to 5.3 million, a drop of over 60%, after which his viewership continued to slip in a downward trend for the rest of the year. And it's weird because I'm not exactly sure what happened at that exact point in time. People have tried to figure it out. It's not clear. It's not clear if people just started to dislike me and didn't want to watch my stuff. It's not clear if that's when the first this is how you don't play hit the internet. It's not clear if YouTube fucked up and changed the way that videos were found in the algorithm. It's just not clear at all. But that was just, yeah, at one point I was getting 13 million views a month. And all of a sudden I'm down to five and I'm like, I didn't do anything. So I'm not sure what caused it. I don't know if anyone knows the real root cause Things of that. got even worse for him after Machinima renegotiated his contract later in the year, reducing his pay. Why this occurred is uncertain, but there is speculation that it was because of his diminishing viewership and the belief that it would continue to decrease. Wrong. They told me why. They told me because they were paying everyone too much money that they had overestimated the amount of money they were going to make on ads on YouTube. Here's how it worked if you were partnered with Machinima. Machinima has rights to put video uh, advertisements on your video uploads. They make all the money on the advertisements. Okay, 100% of the ad revenue, they make. Now, based on the performance of your videos, they will pay you a flat rate per 2,000 video views that you receive. So, let's say, for example, my channel makes 10,000 views in a day. Let's say it was $5.00 per 2,000 views. Well, I made 10,000, it's five times two, right? Do the math, I make that money. It's a flat rate of money that you're gonna make. And the content creators really liked that formula back then because it allowed you to kind of estimate what you were gonna get based on your views. Unlike ad revenue, one video might have tons of ads and make ton of money, another video might not get good ads and make no money. 
So you don't know what you're going to get on any given video at any time. What Machinima did at the time, they did an average formula calculation. They said, oh, it looks like on average, a video will make this much money if it's monetized. So we'll pocket all of that and we'll pay the content creator a portion of it. And $2, or was it two? I don't remember exactly what it was. It might've been $2 per 1,000 views, $5 per 2,000 views. I can't even remember what it was anymore. It's so long ago. But basically that formula made sense. You would make a flat rate they would make more money on the ads, keep the excess revenue, and pay you whatever they had agreed to. So it was a working for everyone. Everyone made something out here, all right? But what ended up happening was, over the years, YouTube ads became less profitable. At first, they were really profitable. But then advertisers said, wait a minute, we're paying so much for these ads, and we're not seeing the kind of uh, results that YouTube is touting that we're going to get for having ads on YouTube, we refuse to pay as much or we refuse to buy as much ad space. So YouTube had to start making more competitive pitches to advertisers. Okay, you can advertise for less on our site. Well, if you're advertising for less, then the people who are watching the ads are earning less per view for Machinima. Machinima was making way less ad revenue all of a sudden and was forced with a dilemma. Oops, we signed everyone up for these contracts where we said we would pay them this flat rate the videos aren't even making that much money anymore on the ads. We're at a loss. They actually found a calculation for like six months. They were taking a fucking loss. They were so dumb. They didn't even realize it. So they had to contact everyone panic mode in the middle of the year and say, hey, we need to renegotiate everyone's contract or else we're going to go under. We're actually going to go out of business because we have no cash flow anymore. So they did. They renegotiated everyone's contract to make money. That's what happened. It had nothing to do with anyone's viewership. It had nothing to do with, oh, someone's being seen in a bad light. In fact, everyone at Machinima took a pay cut. Literally everyone. Even the top, top guys took pay cuts, and they left. A lot of the top guys decided, we're not going to partner with Machinima anymore. We're going to go somewhere else. So that had nothing to do with me at that time. That's ridiculous conjecture, and it's false. Philip, in large part, believed his viewership issues to be not because of his content, but rather because of changes that were occurring in the back end of YouTube. Of course, am I going to publicly admit that, that the reason that I have viewership decline is because of me? No. And again, back then, I was like, oh, my shit doesn't stink. My viewers are telling me they love what I'm doing. It must be something else. And I surmised that maybe YouTube did something behind the scenes to screw over the little guy. He argued that YouTube was changing to accommodate viral content while simultaneously hurting who he called the little guys. There you whose go. content was being deprioritized. And it was this deprioritization that was to blame for his decreasing viewership. Many of his fans and all of his detractors, however, were unconvinced that this was the only problem, if it even was one. Many indicted him for his inflexibility, an argument bolstered by his adamant refusal to alter his content production or release methods. Sometime over the course of 2011, Philip had started dating a woman named Liana Hongen, known better by the pseudonym Panda Lee. <coughs> While Philip's fanbase seemed generally happy that he was now in a relationship, there was a subset who weren't so enthused. Many were shocked to learn that Liana was 11 years Philip's junior, and that they had started dating just after she had turned 18, but most were more concerned about Liana's aggressive tone during cooperative gameplay. Now, I'm going to let this play out. I'm going to comment, but I'm going to say this right now, okay? I'm not going to be doing anything crazy. I'm not going to be revealing tons of ridiculous stuff that's personal, and here's why. This person has not been in my life for many, many years, okay? It would not be fair for me to speak in a manner about personal things when she has not done so. You know what I'm saying? This is someone who I have not had any contact with in very long. I've moved on my life. Now I'm happily married. This is long in the past, but it has to be addressed, obviously. It's part of my history, right? It's well documented. I made vlogs with her, we did, played games together, we traveled together. She was a big part of my life for a long time. But it would be completely unfair for me to come out in like any kind of a negative attack mode here when she has personally decided to be gone from the internet, essentially, and not ever speak negatively about me, which she very well could. I told you guys I was not exactly a bed of roses to, to be back then you know what i mean like i was a flawed human and i had a lot of mistakes that i made and i'm you know good on her that essentially she's never come out publicly and said anything bad about me i'm not going to do that i'm going to speak very matter of factly about the situation by the way it's a very small part of the video thankfully so let's continue and then i'll make my comments 
Alright, I'm going for a start. <laughs> no more talking. Let's press the start playing. before I kill you all. Now it blocks this too. I moved my camera, and now the subtitles are at the bottom of the screen. Hold on. I gotta, I gotta fix this. I want you guys to obviously see the subtitles. Hold on. Because the audio quality is not great. Back then, everything I did, the audio quality was shit, so... Not surprised it's pretty much, you know, not able to be heard here. Actually, I have no idea if this is centered or not. I don't think it is. I don't care. All right. Let's continue. It's fucking stupid. Here we go. I'm going to rewind it so you can hear this part. Gianna's aggressive tone during cooperative gameplay. I'm going for a start. <laughs> no more Let's press the start playing. before I kill you all. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, now you still can't see it. <laughs> 2011 also marked other strange behaviors from Philip. For example, for his DSP Tries It series. Oh my god, we're gonna watch this. Okay, but anyway. Okay, so here's what I have to say about this, alright? First of all, there's been so much bullshit misinformation on the internet about my former relationship. That I'm just going to clarify a few points and then we're going to move on. Number one. Yes, it's absolutely true. We had a ginormous age gap. It was 11 years. Absolutely true. All right. A lot of people criticized me at the time and said, what the hell are you doing with someone, you know, so much younger than you? Doesn't make sense. Kind of ridiculous. Some people don't agree with that kind of stuff. A lot of people don't care. A lot of people say it's your own business, right? Um, at the time... It wasn't really a big concern for me. Like, it wasn't something that I even thought about. It was someone who, you know, I, you know I, I, I had a relationship with, and it wasn't anything that was... How can I say? I, I don't even know how to properly say it, because you say it the wrong way, and then people take it the wrong way. But, you know, let me put it this way. At the time, I didn't see anything wrong with it. Today, yeah... I probably could say, yeah, I see something wrong with it. Especially because, one thing that I will distinctively tell you guys, I love how we're freeze-framed at this when I'm talking about this. One thing that I will distinctively tell you guys uh, a difference here is that at first we were of like mind, and then as we were together longer and longer, that's basically why we grew apart. Because we were basically kind of like two different age ranges and generations, you know? I was in one mindset where I wanted to go with my life and she was in a different, completely different mindset where she wanted to go with her life and those paths weren't aligned anymore. You know what I'm saying? And I think that was directly because of the age. Um, and that's my fault. I'm the one who willingly engaged in the relationship. You know what I'm saying? There was nothing legally wrong with it, but age-wise, it kind of didn't make sense at first. You know, oh, we both like games or whatever. It kind of makes sense. But then over time, it's like, what the hell was I thinking? You know what I mean? Um, and now to comment on her behavior, I'm still commenting on this with this on the screen, by the way. To comment on her behavior, yes, publicly, she was incredibly uh, confrontational. I think that's actually the best way to put it forward. Her personality was very publicly confrontational. She always wanted to seem like she was superior. She would get to the one up on me or anyone involved in anything that she was involved in, right? She would constantly be razzing me. People liked that, right? People absolutely liked that, that she was that kind of a person because they thought that was a good way to play off of me. Normally, I was the only guy involved in my content or I was the alpha of the content. You know what I mean? Like, I was the one in charge. All of a sudden, there was an off play of that. And people thought it was like two conflicting personalities. They saw uncomfortableness sometimes when we made a video of gameplay together. And people actually liked that. At the very same time. Alright? And this will actually, I believe, be addressed a little bit later here. But we're coming up to it. I will say this. I 100% take responsibility for the fact that if she was ever in my content and was deemed defensive, that's my fault. Why? It was my content. I can argue a million ways to Sunday to try to defend myself, but I feel that's an indefendable position. It's my channel. It's my videos. It's my content. It's my streams. I am the one ultimately in control of my content and, quite frankly, my life. I was the one who actively made the decisions to have my ex as part of my content. And when I did, 
a lot of people took that as a turnoff and said, wow, I really don't like her personality. She's very confrontational. She's very offensive and says things that are meant to, to piss people off and make, you know, even make demean you and degrade you, right? And totally I get that, that that was a negative thing for my viewing audience. It was my fault, 100%, that I did that and put that as part of my content, all right? I never had to do that. And I've said this over the years as well. I've absolutely said, listen, one of the biggest mistakes I ever did, and now I know this, and I'm very different now in my personal life now than I was back then. I literally shared you guys everything. I, I, I vlogged every piece of life. I went to a store, I vlogged it. I went on vacation, I vlogged it. I ate for DSP Tries It, I vlogged it. I took a shit, okay, I didn't vlog shaking, shitting. One time I pretended to shit, but I didn't actually vlog my shitting. But you understand what I'm saying? Like, everything was shared with the public. And when I shared everything with the public, I had no private life anymore. So now, all of a sudden, you're seeing things that are harmful to us, to, to our private life. And people were capitalizing on that, especially if they did not like my ex. Oh, let's use this as an attack. Let's use that as an attack, right? You're going to see things coming up, things that people commonly said as negative things towards me that are relation to her. And it's like, if I just separated that, if I had made my private life separate from my public persona and the content that I put out on the internet, I likely would have avoided most, if not all, of those issues. It is 100% my fault and i am taking ownership for that and i am not ever going to blame someone else for my shortcomings because i put that stuff in my content okay so now i'll say that back then not so much as you guys know back then i was a very defensive person right now i will take ownership of that now without further ado let's see me take a shower he took video of himself showering with an axe body scrubber But even compared to all of this, his worst trouble was yet to come. What's wrong with me watch, recording myself with an axe body scrubber? I thought it was a funny video. Like, literally, I was, I was looking for a variety of content, okay? I was. I was looking for a variety of stuff. And this was a DSP tries it, a one-off DSP tries it, a silly thing that I did. It wasn't meant to be a serious thing or anything. And one night, I bought, I bought an axe body scrubber. And I was like, I just want to do something really stupid, dumb. So I just set up this camera in my bathroom and I filmed it. And everyone's telling me, man, you must have been drunk and you did that by accident. It's like, so let me get this straight. You think I was pissed drunk and you think I set up a camera in my bathroom on a tripod. I positioned it perfectly to cut out my lower end so I wouldn't show nudity and get banned from YouTube. I framed it perfectly. I had it positioned the right distance so the camera wouldn't get wet, but also so the acoustics were perfect. I recorded this whole thing, edited it in the computer, put a DSP Tries It logo over it, and uploaded it to YouTube and promoted it all while drunk. How much do you think I drank? Do you think I had like 17 things of tequila? Like, oh my God. Right? Of course, this is absolutely ridiculous, what, what people were saying back then. I did it on purpose, because I thought it was something stupid and funny. I didn't take myself seriously, right? I didn't. I seriously didn't think it was a big deal. Just, I made another one of these videos, all right, with head and shoulder shampoo in early 2017 or 2018. I forget exactly when it was. I think it was early 2018. It was supposed to be like a spiritual successor to this silly video. It was meant to be dumb. Not serious, obviously. But some people, oh my God, this is a sign that Phil was really changing. This was his downfall. It was a silly thing I did, man. It wasn't anything like, it would have been one thing if it was like a series of videos where you could see me nude, nude or half nude or whatever. It was nothing like that at all. It's pre completely preposterous. Okay, let's that would arise from an unexpected place, his own fan base. Uh-oh, here we go. Here we go, guys. 
In 2012, one of Philip's fans going by the name EvilAJ2010 was blocked from commenting on Philip's videos when he mentioned his belief that Panda Lee was the cause of Philip's change of attitude and, therefore, loss of viewers. <clears throat> Incensed by his banning, Evil AJ published a montage of Philip's gameplay footage of Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty in early 2013, entitling it, This is how you don't play MGS2. Throughout the nearly hour-long montage, he peppered in comments from viewers frustrated with how poorly Philip was playing, especially noting how he was ignoring important mechanics as a direct response to Philip's claim that viewers were extremely positive to the playthrough. This video showcased some of the worst of his play, where he would often blame the controls or game design for his poor performance. When exactly this video went online and its precise viewership have been lost, but some sources claim that it quickly garnered over a million views. One of Philip's tweets, apparently criticizing the video for stealing his footage, predates the upload that currently exists. These imply that the original was somehow taken down, possibly by Philip, and then later re-uploaded by Evil AJ on February 15th, 2013. This has already been debunked. I did not take this video down. The only times in my entire history as a content creator that I ever attempted to take a video down is if someone actually 100% stole my content, okay? Didn't edit it. Did nothing to it. No commentary, no editing. They literally just ripped my raw video and then re-uploaded it. There's been times when I did attempt to take down that style of content. Um, and that's actually how I know how the YouTube content uh, claiming and, uh, excuse me, the copyright system works because I've attempted it. Here's how it works. You think someone stole your content. You then file a copyright claim against it. YouTube verifies that you're real or they're supposed to. Sometimes they don't. And then they hit them with a takedown. The video gets taken down. That person now has, I believe it's two weeks to respond and state, oh, I'm doing a counterclaim because I think this is fake. And then once they file their counterclaim, that goes through. The original person who claimed the video for copyright gets the response. And now you determine if you want to proceed. The only way you can proceed is by getting a lawyer. There is no other means to say, hey, no, I really th say this is my content and I want to go through with it. That YouTube's opinion is at that point, get a lawyer and sue them or the whole thing gets dropped. Okay? So... That's the process. It's a garbage process. There's literally no way to permanently take down a video on YouTube without a lawyer. It's just not possible, okay? Now, maybe big companies have other ways around this. I don't know. I'm just telling you from my perspective as an individual content creator, this was the process that was used by then, okay? Looks like my food just got delayed. It's not going to come for about another 20 minutes, so you guys are in luck. We're not going on break yet. <clears throat> um, so... In this case, I absolutely positively have no recollection whatsoever of taking down any This Is How You Don't Play videos ever. Ever. I don't recall this. If someone took down Evil AJ's original This Is How You Don't Play, it wasn't me. It sounds to me like maybe someone abused YouTube's copyright system. Just how someone impersonated Ubisoft and said, hey, Phil, we're taking down your Splinter Cell playthrough. Likely, a fan of mine was pissed that this video existed, didn't like the fact that it spun me in a negative light, and probably took it down. Okay. But apparently, everyone over the years said it was me. It was not me. Absolutely not. As I've told you guys, the only videos I ever tried to take down, ever, all right, was stuff that was 100% lifted and re-uploaded. That was it. Anything else that has commentary, criticism, this is how you don't play, anything negative, I just let it ride. Because I was like, I don't have a lawyer. There's no way I'm ever going to be able to get this stuff to go down fully. You know what I mean? And I was never going to sue anyone over it either, okay? <clears throat> Okay. Any people who are going to be drama queens right now, I'm just going to ban them because I'm, I'm trying to do video here. If you haven't noticed, there's people purposely trying to derail me. Um, and I'm not going to put up with this. So I'm just going to ban those people right now so I don't have to deal with them. And then we can continue and focus. Sadly, this is what happens when I do things that people think are interesting. You get idiots who try to come here and derail my chat and I'm just not going to have it. So I'm just going to take them out right now and then continue. Go ahead, please. Someone else say something so I can take you out and I can focus on what I'm doing here. Okay. All right. So, to reiterate, I was aware that this existed because people told me. I never actually watched it. I'm tr I'll am i be honest with you. I've never watched the whole thing. I've seen clips of it. I've never watched the whole video to this day. 
That's why this is a good potential for future React content. But I've never watched this, okay? Um, and I didn't claim it. I didn't claim it. I didn't take it down. I had nothing to do with it. And people blaming me for it is kind of messed up. When I purposely tell everyone I don't believe in abusing YouTube's copyright system, I think it's messed up because it's happened to me before. That's one of the major reasons why I would never do it because I've been the victim of this. And I don't think it's fair. Even if you could argue that this is a legal gray area, you know, taking someone else's content and editing it to make them look bad, right? It's still not worth fighting unless you can go to court. I'm not going to court over it. So I would never claim someone's this is how you don't play video like this or, or take it down. Someone else did it and I'm actually pissed that they did because then I get the negative flack for it. And by the way, to this day this happens, I get notifications on a daily basis from places like Twitter saying, oh, well, here's an update on the content that you requested to be taken down. I'm like, the what? I don't take down any content. I don't know what you're talking about. Someone out there has basic information about me and these services are so dumb, they think it's really me. And they hit me with these dumb claims. Or not me, excuse me. They hit these people with dumb claims. There's been someone who actually said to me, can you help me with this? I, I actually contacted Twitter. And I said, hey, Twitter, can you stop this? Because it's not me. I can tell you 100% I've never done one of these takedowns. Twitter came back to me a week later. They ignored my request a week later and said, hey, do you still have this problem? And I, can you elaborate on it? And I said, yes. And I gave them examples. I said, there's two examples here where people are saying that their content was taken down and it wasn't me. Twitter then closed the request. They didn't care. You know? there's no, I wish that there was an avenue where these companies cared. They don't. They just don't give a shit. To them, they're like, well, I'm not in trouble, so fuck it. They just completely ignored me. So I feel bad for people who get their shit claimed in my name. It's never me. I don't do this stuff. Trust me, I'm a busy enough individual. I don't have time for this shit. I just want to play fun games, have fun with you guys on stream. I don't care about people making fun of me and this shit. But back then, this incensed me. This video, knowing that there was someone out there taking my content and spinning it in a way that made me look really bad, I was afraid, admittedly, that this was the beginning of a slippery slope. That, yeah, the first video that comes out and is negative about me, big deal. The second video that comes out, all right. But when there's 10, there's 20, next thing you know, all people are going to care about is making fun rather than being a part of the original content. Laughing at instead of laughing with. You see the difference? And quite frankly, that is exactly what happened. Literally overnight, when these started to become popular, instead of being, oh, let's go watch Phil's content and laugh because he's a, he's kind of a silly guy and he, this is his shtick, which made me money because of ad revenue, it became, let's watch This Is How You Don't Play with the stolen content and Phil makes absolutely no money on it, yet somehow he, he you know, we all know about him and we're watching his content. Right now, if you're watching this stream illegally be restreamed, or if you're watching this clip of this video in someone else's montage about this, this, this DSP Reacts, I don't make anything on it, right? So you're, it's hurting my business. And back then, this was a huge concern for me. I was like, man, I didn't have crowdfunding back then. I didn't have alternate sources of income. All I had was ad revenue. And all I saw was these are views that likely I should be earning and I'm not going to get because someone took my content without asking me and made this montage. And by the way, I outright have said this over the years. I would have given permission as long as the person gave me some kind of a positive shout out. At least saying, listen, I'm making fun of Phil. And yes, we're all going to laugh at his expense. But in reality, he's been around for a long time. Give it an effort to maybe check out his original content if you like this video. If they had just said something basic like that, I would have said everyone could just take my content, no problem, go ahead. But none of them ever cared. They just took it right off my channel without permission, made these montages, made me look bad, and this was directly one of the reasons why a lot of people stopped watching my content and moved on to other stuff or just watched the negative shit. Directly, cause and effect, this is how you don't play, was the beginning of that. Thank you to Jay Hale. For a $20 tip, saying, didn't know that you were going to do this today. Good shit. Well, thank you, Jay, for the tip. I appreciate that. Again, reminder that I am trying to make enough on today's stream as if I were doing two streams because this is the only thing I'm doing today due to the marathon. So thank you for the support. Uh, yeah, let's continue, shall we? And by the way, I believe my food is still... Oh, my food's on the way. All right. We can maybe go 10 more minutes, but then we got to adjourn for a break here. Let's let's go a little bit further. Here we go. Because we're just getting to this society don't play. It's just getting good. Here we go.
Whatever the exact case may be, this video quickly sparked a series of similar montages. And here they all each are. With the title of prefix, This Is How You Don't Play, showcasing Philip's worst moments. These videos would range in length from 10 minutes to over two hours. Actually, I've seen ones that were over five hours being made over the years. And again, the difference between then and now, back then, my only source of income was YouTube ad revenue. I had nothing else coming in. So if you're watching my content here and making, you know, making fun of me and you never come to my channel to watch it, you're essentially, I'm getting my content stolen and I'm not making any money on it. As opposed to today, a lot of people now have told me <clears throat> they've watched This Is How You Don't Play and that made them want to come check out my streams. They come check out the stream. Now they're a regular and they're supporting. That's different, but I had to change my business model to make that viable. Back then, a you know, one less view was stolen income. And that was why I was so concerned and so angry about it back then. In short order, these montages would overtake Philip's own video content when searching for his channel Correct. due to their popularity, pushing his own content farther down the search results. Philip, enraged by this, set about attempting to remove these videos from YouTube. In a misunderstanding of fair use law, he claimed that these videos were violating his copyright and argued that while his videos were transformative since he was playing a game, these other videos were stealing his content by using his video footage. And so, he went about systematically flagging the videos for YouTube's review. Despite his efforts, these videos would stay online and continue to multiply as the months dragged on. Along with this, another series parodying the DSP Tries It videos would gain popularity, criticizing different aspects of his failures or his character, especially his ego. For example, one, one thing I do want to say is, I, again, Frederick Knudsen was wrong here. I did not try to take these down. By the way, thank you, Jay Hill, for another $8 tip. Now we're up to 200 and climbing. Thank you so much. Uh, I did not take the videos down. I'll I will, I'm sorry, I'm just not going to budge on this one. I didn't do it, and no one will ever say there's evidence that I did it besides it says that I tried to take it down, but those, I'm telling you, if that ever happened, it's an impersonator. I did not try to take down any This Is How You Don't Play videos. Never. It was only people who outright lifted my stuff illegally. It was not people who did these This Is How You Don't Play videos, all right? All right, guys, actually, my food is about to arrive. So this is a good place to end part two. I'm going to take a break, and there will be other parts. Obviously, we're more, only just halfway through. So there will be more parts to this. But for now, thank you for watching. And please watch the future parts if you're on stream. Stay tuned. Awesome. Thank you.